All right. So yes, lesson seven, we're in the book of Numbers. So I'm sure maybe some of you were just drooling all week. You're like, oh, we got done with Leviticus. I can't wait for Numbers. <laughs> but actually, Numbers uh, is an incredible book. It really is. It's incredible about what it says about God. You know, that's the key. Some, I'm, I'm going to get ahead of myself. Um, but that's the lens that we're always wanting to see. You know, what does this teach us about God? Where is this in the big scheme of things? Right? Um, so there are some great things about the history of redemption, the character of God, the purposes of God in Numbers. But there are also some very sad things in the book of Numbers. Um, and so uh, there's a lot we can gain from it. Um, so the three ways I'm going to approach it, this book, there's so much stuff to talk about in this book. It's a large book with a lot of narrative and a lot of really amazing stories, a lot of great spiritual truths. You know, there are some stories that I'm not going to, to bring up. So sorry about that. But I'm really going to be approaching it three ways. What do we learn about God? What do we learn about Israel's future and God's plan of redemptive history? And what can we learn from Israel's wilderness wanderings? And this is not some incredible, like, highly, you know, scholarly hermeneutical key that you can only understand the book of Numbers with, with these questions. Why did I choose these questions? Really, that's how we should approach every scripture. What do I learn about God here? You know, where is this in this whole scheme of things? What can I learn about the ultimate purposes of God and how God moves in history? And then how can I apply this to my life? So really nothing special about the way I'm breaking it down tonight. Um, so let's start with that first question. Oh yeah, there's the outline. Um, so that's going to be the outline tonight. But we're going to cover the first question. What can we learn about God in Numbers? Um so in Numbers, like I said, we have a great, you know, really with all of the scriptures, we have God's resume. We have God's resume of who he is, how he acts in history, how he relates to people, and we see his character. You know, if you, if you, you know, I don't know, you know, you own your own company. I don't know if you ever hire people, but, but you know, when we look at a person's application in the resume, what, what, are, what are they looking at? They're wanting to see their history. You know, do they have good experience? Are they qualified? Right? What we see with numbers is that we have a God who can be trusted. Right? We see, we, that's what we see in all of the scriptures. We're seeing God's, God's resume. And that's why it's important. You know, there are seasons in life. There are seasons where you'll find yourself just more of clinging to a couple of verses and you're meditating on it. And then there are maybe seasons where you're reading through maybe larger portions. Um, there are seasons for it all, but that's why it's very important to get the full counsel of God because it's God's resume. And it's meant to strengthen your faith as a Christian. All right. Um, so what does Numbers teach us about God? Um, well, first, why is the book called Numbers? And there's a very profound answer to that. Because there's a lot of numbers in the book of Numbers. <laughs> um, now, I'll say, you know, so you even hear that right off the bat, and you're like, wow, that just sounds so much fun to read, you know. So I just want to encourage you, books with a lot of genealogies, books with a lot of numbers and attention to detail, um, don't, you know, there is no wasted space in the Bible. It's always there for a reason. Right, so again, instead of getting kind of lost in the details, it's good to sit back and be like, why is this here? Why is this here? You know, we talked about the genealogies is usually God's, that means that, that redemptive history is making progress and is moving forward, right? And so instead of, he's not just having fun wanting to know his family history. You know, he's, he's, he's tracing redemptive history at that point, right? And so when we see something with a lot of numbers, there's a reason for it. So what do all the numbers in the book of Numbers teach us about God? You know, this is taking that step back. Why is this here? All of the numbers teach us that God is faithful and able to fulfill all of his promises and purposes. So in chapters 1 through 4, you, there's a census of all of Israel's army and a census of all the Levites who would be devoted to the service and worship of, of Yahweh for the people. 
Um, and the, and it's really incredible when you really think about it, right? You're, so you're saying, how can all of these numbers, I don't know if you've read and you're familiar with it, but there's a huge census. Like, how is that? What is, I don't, I don't get it. What can that teach me about God? Again, why is it there? Let's think about this. Israel has, in the census, um, 603,550 600, fighting men. Think about the population of greater Pensacola, right? That's how many fighting men that they have. You have, um, they had 8,580 Levites who were devoted to tabernacle worship, right? And then we get a list of all of the tribes, and they're all camped around the tabernacle. So hundreds of thousands of people encamped around the tabernacle. And remember that God promised that he was going to dwell with the people. And he had entered the tabernacle, made a covenant with them, and he was there with them, right? And so you have all of these people, all of these camps of of, of each tent around the tabernacle. And then you have Judah, the tent of Judah, having the prominent place leading the pack. Again, why is this all there? Um, where did, let's stop first and ask, where did all of these people come from? Who did all of these people come from? Abraham. God had promised Abraham that he would make his, his, his offspring a mighty nation. He would deliver them from Egypt. He would take them to be, have their own land where he would be their people. What did the numbers teach us about God? That God is faithful in fulfilling His promises. Right? In Genesis, it said that, that um, there, there would be, that the, the promised seed of the woman would be a king from the tribe of Judah. And then yet you have the tent of Judah having prominent place around the tabernacle. God is doing what He said He would be doing. So we established that, that Eden was the kingdom of God uh, the pattern of the kingdom, where where God would be with His people in His place, and that um, and that the fall it was lost. It was the kingdom lost, right? And that Abraham and the promise of Abraham was the kingdom of God promised, and so now it's going from merely a promise to finding fulfillment, and it's moving forward. So you're seeing now now this promise is coming into fruition. It's making progress. Um. So it teaches us that God is faithful and able to fulfill His promises. Then we, could, then we see some more numbers given in chapter 7. Um, you have uh, some of the details about the tabernacle's consecration. Again, you read that and you're saying, why is this here? Why all of these details about all the different you know, amounts of shekels that were given and all the different animals that were given? Why is this here? Um, and so, again, these why are these details here? Now, I just want to make an established fact. You know, this is not the details about the tabernacle's construction, right? That was in Exodus, right, where the tabernacle was built. And it was built with gold and all these costly garments and stuff. Very wealthy, very wealthy, incredible, you know, tabernacle, right? And God provided it all through, you know, when they left Egypt, got the, they essentially plundered the Egyptians. The Egyptians were giving them riches. And so they left Egypt rich. And they were so rich that they were able to build this incredible tabernacle, right? But this isn't that. This is after the fact. And Israel um, has been at Mount Sinai for a year. So where is this in the history? So, in, so they came to Mount Sinai. Um, this is a year later before they start leaving Sinai, and the people have st- have so much abundant provisions that they're able to come and bring them before the Lord and to consecrate, not only to have construction of the tabernacle, but to come for the consecration. Again, what does that teach us about God? Think about all of these hundreds of thousands of people in the milder- middle of a barren wilderness for a year. And they didn't go broke when they were making the tabernacle. You know, they were able to, to come and offer up all of these things for the temple's co- consecration. And so, again, what are these details? What are they showing us? 
God has been faithful and is able to fulfill his promises and his purposes. Then, another set of numbers in Genesis, or excuse me, Numbers chapter 26. We have another census. So the book of Numbers, we see the sad story. You have two census, uh, two censuses, right? Is that how you say it? Going on, right? So you have the, the first census going on at the, at the beginning of all the, the, um, of the people. Um, and, but then we, we hear the sad story about how God brought the people all the way to the edge of the promised land. And the spies came back and said, yeah, the land's flowing with milk and honey. It's great. But there are the sons of the, of, the, of the Anak there, filled with giants. They will kill our, our wives and our children. Come, let's make a leader. Let's head back to Egypt. Right? And, and, and Caleb and Joshua are saying, no, if God is for us, he's for us. Let's go. Let's fight. We got this. But they sit there plagued with fear and come back, and and want to go back. And so God says, okay, you get what you want. The very people you are afraid would die are going to be the people who actually enter into the land. Your children will be the ones who enter. You're going to die in the wilderness. Um, And so you have that generation wandering. You know, a lot of people will say that the book of Numbers is the wasted years of Israel. And so you have that generation wandering around in the wilderness until finally they die. That generation dies. Anyone, anyone 20 and old, older, part of that first generation, dead, minus Caleb and Joshua, because they believed God. And so, but God, but, but that does not thwart the promises. And the, you know, God promised to Abraham that his seed would be a great nation and that in his seed the nations of the earth would be blessed. So that generation's failure did not thwart the ultimate purposes of God. Their faithlessness did not nullify His faithfulness. And so what happened? God faithfully um, preserved Himself a people wandering around in the wilderness, fighting all of these different enemies, right? And to where later on you get to the census and you see that the next generation who are able to go has six, um, 601,730 fighting men. Almost the same. God, why is that here? God has been faithful and He's able to fulfill what He promised He would do. So what do the numbers teach us in the book of Numbers about God? That God is faithful and He is able to fulfill and and do what He said He was going to do. So we see that in the storyline, but then there are also these incredible verses that are, that are said about God's character that kind of go along with the storyline. And these, I would highly encourage, like there are some um, fighter verse, memory verse uh, verses in here, and I wanted to share them with you just to kind of reinforce that point. Numbers eleven twenty three. And the Lord said to Moses, Is the, Lord hand, is the Lord's hand shortened? Now you shall see whether my word will come true for you or not. He said that. It's incredible. He's saying my hand's too small that I can't do that. You will see. Right? Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he, has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? Again, we're seeing this beautiful picture of God's resume. And it's not just, we're not just to read that and be like, man, they should have trusted them. We read that and say, this is who God is. I, I will need to trust Him. Right? Um, all right, let's move on to the second question. What do we learn about God's plan for Israel and redemptive history? Again, this is not some profound cu- question, but it's just saying, you know, how is this pointing to the big picture of redemptive history? You know, this is a foundational stone, of a building, you know, brick of something else to come, what are some things that we learn about God's plan for Israel and redemptive history? I want to talk first about Aaron's priestly blessing in Numbers 6, 22 through 27. Um, So what do we learn? The first question that I want to answer about that, um, what do we learn? I'm going to read that and we're going to study that for a moment. But the first answer, one thing we can glean from, what do we learn about God's plan for Israel? 
and redemptive history. What do we learn about that in Numbers? We learn that true blessing is being in the kingdom of God. That's what we learn in Numbers. And we remember we define the kingdom of God as God's redemptive rule over His people in His place. So we see that this is now the kingdom promise um, as, a, as an act of restoration from the kingdom lost. And God's redemptive plan is progressing and is moving forward and moving forward in motion. And so at this stage in redemptive history, we have Israel who has been redeemed by God from Israel, or excuse me, from Egypt, the house of slavery, to be God's people under his rule. And they're moving forward to, to his place. So we see that true blessing is to be a part of the kingdom of God. I mean, that's why we were, we were made, right? To know God, to enjoy Him forever. So that's the, that's the apex of blessing, is to be in God's kingdom. Um, so Israel is beginning to experience the blessing of having favor and reconciliation with God, which is the ultimate goal of redemptive history. So um, before we look at this text, I want to read a background to that text, because there's some background in Leviticus. Okay, um, let's read uh, Leviticus, Leviticus nine twenty two through twenty four again. This this helps us understand the background of the priestly blessing in um, in Numbers. It says, "Then Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and blessed them, and he gave and and he, and, and he came down from the offering, from offering the sin offering, the burnt offering, and the peace offerings." And Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting. And when they came out, they blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the pieces of fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. So here's the pattern we got going on here. Aaron, the great high priest, comes as the representative of the people of Israel and offers up sacrifices of atonement on behalf of the people. God accepts it. His wrath is satisfied. And now Israel is blessed with the blessing of being able to dwell with God as His people. So that's the pattern. Does that make sense? So, so, so here's just kind of what's happening. Again, the high priest is coming to offer up sacrifices of atonement on behalf of the people. God accepts it. His wrath is appeased. And now the people enjoy favor and blessing of having God's presence with them. Okay, so, and, and he blesses them. He blesses the people after the sacrifice, and God's presence comes, right? Okay, so that's the context. Now, let's look more at that prayer of blessing. He, what did he bless the people? What did he say? We're going to go to Numbers now and see. Numbers, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to Aaron and his son saying, Thus you shall bless the people of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord let the light of His countenance upon you and give you peace. So shall they put My name upon the people of Israel and I will bless them. So we have that pattern. Propitiation, acceptance by God, and then the blessing of God's presence. Okay. So we see what is the blessing. The blessing is being... God's people under His rule, being in the kingdom of God, where one has reconciliation and favor with God. And you'll see that this is the greatest blessing um, that Israel would experience. You'll see this later on in the psalmists and just many times throughout Israel's history where they're praying that prayer, God, make your face to shine upon us. Right? Because that's the apex of blessing. That's the reason we were made. That's the is reason Israel was made, to be God's people who would then bring the blessing of God, who, the, who would bring the Messiah, who would then come and bring the kingdom of God and the blessing of God to all people and all tribes. Okay? Um, you know, when Moses is praying and he's interceding before, the, um, before God when they worship at the golden calf, he's saying, Lord, please, if, you don't, if your presence doesn't go with us, then don't take us to that land. Why? Because God's presence and favor is the greatest blessing and enjoyment that anyone can face and can have. It's the reason why we were made. 
Um, but we also know that this wasn't just the goal of Israel. God did not want just Israel to be his special people forever. Israel had a mission to be God's special people who would then deliver the Messiah to the whole world. Um, and then the Messiah would come and bring the blessing of God's favor and bring e Eden back to the cosmos, to the whole world. So that's the ultimate goal. God would say in, in, in Numbers 14.21, But truly as I live, all of the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. That was God's ultimate purpose for Israel. Was that His glory would cover the nations. And that He would have a people from every tribe and tongue who would enjoy being under the rule and under the care of God. Um, so this priestly Blessing is the ultimate goal of redemption. That all the nations would experience the blessing of being God's people under His rule in His place. But not only is the blessing the same and the goal the same, but the pattern by which that is accomplished is the same. You remember the pattern of the atonement, acceptance, God's presence? The pattern is just still the same but it's just with much greater realities. Um, and what do I mean by that? I do, wanna, I do want to, 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 to elaborate on that, but I do want to share a personal story in light of this verse. I love this verse. I prayed over my family every night. Um, I've prayed it over my kids when I, they came out of the womb. Um, I love this verse. Um, there was one time a couple years back on the way back to Peru, and, uh, and uh, I was really just hungry, and I wasn't hungry for food. You know, I was always, I'm always hungry for food, you know. Um, but I was just hungry for this verse to be a reality in my life. You know, um, I, don't, I can't remember what I was. I don't know if I was discouraged, depressed, doubting. I don't know what it was, but I was just hungry. Like, Lord, do this. We're sitting here waiting, you know, for our, for our plane to come. Um, we were in Fort Lauderdale Airport and just trying to get in the Word. Someone was just going to all the different places in Scripture where this is said. You know, the psalmist, make your face shine upon us, Lord. In this verse, Lord, make your face to shine. Lord, Lord, just pleading with God in ways that I just don't normally do. And I believe um, the Lord then led me to this verse. And I want to read it. Um, Romans eight thirty one through 34. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is it to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. And the reason why I bring that, 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 this verse up, because I believe that the gospel, is that that was the pattern in Numbers. And that the gospel is the fulfillment. That was just the shadow. But this is the fulfillment. And here's, here's what I want us to see. Um, this, the, the, the common things that are going on here. The Lord bless you and keep you. Paul says based on the atonement, based upon all the glorious things that Christ has done. He said, may the Lord bless you and keep you. If God is for you, who can be against you? The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? The Lord let the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is it to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Peace. Kept. No condemnation. The, the work of Christ was sufficient. And He's now interceding for you. You have peace. Um, so, the pattern is still the same, and yet, but, it's still, but it's greater. You have the only Son of God coming, bearing the wrath of God in our place, being our propitiation and our expiation. Right? And then, as the high priest coming and bringing the favor of and the kingdom of God to His people. 
right? And so I feel like it was just the Lord saying, I've already blessed you that way. You just need to believe it. That's a reality. That's what my son did, right? Um, and so, final, done. So the Lord has blessed us in Christ. The Lord has made His face to shine upon us in Christ. The Lord has been gracious to us and will be, and He will give us peace forever because of Jesus. Because of Jesus, that's all we will know for all of eternity. We are the, under the wonderful privilege of being God's people, right, under His rule. Um, and right now, the place where does God rule is in our hearts, in the hearts of the church. But one day, it'll be the whole world. Okay, um, so what else are some things that we can learn from redemptive history? Let's talk about Balaam's oracles. So Balaam, Balaam, Balaam was a pagan seer who was summoned by the king of Moab to curse the people of Israel. Israel was in his region and had defeated King Og. Balak was hoping that if Balaam would curse Israel, they would have misfortune. Mis misfortune. However, God had already blessed Israel and told Abraham that he would bless those who blessed them and curse those who cursed them. So that's not a good situation for a man who sent out to curse them. God has blessed. They're blessed. Um, so without getting into all of the the different scenarios of this pretty strange story. Um, I do want to just cover a couple things about what Balaam says, because again, it gives us a lot into Israel's future and understanding rightly redemptive history. Um, so when Balaam does, actually, he goes a few times um, to speak over Israel, but the Holy Spirit actually comes upon him and he blesses Israel. And I want to go over a couple of oracles that he says. Um, do I have it up here? The oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor. The oracle of the man whose eye is open. The oracle of him who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty, falling down with his eyes uncovered. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob. So he's on a mountain looking over and seeing everything. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your, your encampments, O Israel. Like palm groves that stretch afar, like gardens beside a river, like aloes that the Lord has planted, like cedar trees, Beside the waters, water shall flow from his buckets, and his seed will be many in the water, in many waters. His king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. God brings him out of Egypt, and is for him like a, like the horns of the wild ox. He shall eat up the nations, his adversaries, and he shall break their bones in pieces and pierce them through with his arrows. He crouched, he lay down like a lion. Like a, like a lioness, who will rouse him up? Blessed are those who bless you, and cursed are those who cursed you. Let's go back to this. What is this? What does verse 6 and 7, what does that imagery kind of remind you of? Think previous. Eden. Right? So he's explaining Israel in Edenic terms. But it's prophetic. He's not literally saying, "Wow, look in this wilderness. There's these these you know waters. You know, it's the temple of God. It's the new Israel is the new Eden, right? That's how he's prophesying. But then what does he say? He says, um, "Water shall flow. Wait, where is it? Da, 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 da. Water shall flow from his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters. His king, king." shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. So there's a singular king, right? God brings him out of Egypt and is for him like the horns of the wild ox. He shall eat up the nations, his adversaries, and shall break their bones in pieces and pierce them with arrows. He crouched, he lay down like a lion, and like a lioness, who will rouse him up? What is that from? Genesis 49, right? Where, where, where the blessing of Judah, Judah gets blessed and, and, and there's a king with a scepter who would rule. He's like a lion crouching up. So he connects this king, right, um, with the promised king of Judah, who's like a lion. And then he says, blessed are those who bless you, cursed are those who curse you. Who's that for to? It's the promise made to Abraham. So he's connecting, he's seeing Israel as this new Eden who will one day be ruled by a ruler like a lion, 
from the tribe of Judah who will bring in the fulfillment of the promises of Abraham. It's from a pagan false prophet. right? He also will say, Numbers 24, 17, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Remember the scepter from the king of Judah. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheth. So he's saying that with his scepter, he will crush the head of Moab, the enemies of God. So he's talking about a future ruler who would come and rule the nations and crush the head of the enemies of God. Again, what does that bring us? What, you know, it's the same author here. You know, what should we be thinking about? Wow, who would crush the head of the serpent, right? So he's making all of these allusions and, and connecting them together with these different prophecies that have been made. Um, so who is this king, right? Um, Revelation, actually, uh, where is the one where the, oh yeah, a star, a star shall come out of Jacob, right? Who is this star? Who is this ruler? Who is this one with the scepter? Revelation twenty two sixteen says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root of David, tribe of Judah. I'm the root, root and the offspring of David, the bright morning star. So what, do, what, are, what else what do we learn about Israel's future and redemptive history? That Jesus is the Savior from the tribe of Judah who will rule the nations and crush the head of the serpent. Um, lastly, we got time, we're good. Lastly, what can we learn from Israel's wilderness wanderings? So like I said, Numbers is essentially the wasted years of Israel's history. Um, God is highlighted and seen as glorious. Israel, you can't read it without getting frustrated. right? But what we need to see is, is, is very much see ourselves in Israel a lot. Now, there are, there are differences between the church and between Israel. Right? We're going we're gonna to see that in Deuteronomy. You know, God did not give Israel a spirit to obey. Right? Um, but a few. Caleb was a man, it'll say in Numbers, who had a different spirit among them. He had a circumcised heart, right? Um, so they didn't have, the, you know, so without getting into all that yet, but just saying there are differences. But the New Testament uses this story in Numbers as a way to ex- exhort New Testament Christians. So, so we really do need to, to be asking, how, what do I need to learn about this? Not just say, yeah, once saved, always saved. I got the Holy Spirit. There's difference. Yes, but that does not mean that there are not exhortations to continue on and to finish the race and warnings given, right? And so, um, so we're going to let the New Testament answer that question because it does. But um, chapters 1 and 10 happen and you think, yes, all right, Israel's been at Mount Sinai on the move. Uh, they're ready to move. God's been faithful. Let's go. Right, and then as I mentioned, you know, but 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 what's the first thing that they do when they leave Mount Sinai? They complain, right? Um, they complain about their misfortunes. Chapter twelve: Miriam and Moses' right hand man, Aaron, come up to oppose him. Chapter thirteen: Israel's at the border of the of, of the promised land and uh, doesn't want to go because of the fear of all the giants and wants to go back, right? Um, God's wrath is burned against them. Moses again stands up and intercedes for them, right? And God hears his prayer, but says there will be consequences. The whole generation is not going to enter, except their kids. Then, chapter 20, Moses himself does not uphold the name of Yahweh amongst the people, and he's not allowed to enter. So you see failure after failure after failure. What can we learn from their disobedience? Um, this will be just from the New Testament here. Um, let's first go to 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 4. I don't I didn't write that whole verse up, but I'll read it if you want to turn in your Bibles. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 4. He says, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses, and in and in the cloud, and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. 
I love that imagery. What did Moses do? He, he, he hit the rock and it nourished the people. He's bringing some typology in here and saying the rock was Christ that nourished the people. Anyway, now these things took place as examples to us. Verse 6, examples to us that we might des not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. Right? Nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these, happens to, these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation is overtaking you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with a temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, free idolatry. John MacArthur says on this whole text, he says that about the, the generation, he says that they died in the wilderness because of their failure of self-discipline and consequent indulgence of every evil desire. Four major sins characterize them. Idolatry, sexual immorality, testing God, and complaining. So he's saying, given an example, don't fall into the same snares that they did of idolatry and sexual immorality and complaining. He's like, these things are written for us. Flee idolatry so that we can make it to the promised land. Okay? Um, the author of Hebrews really picks up on this theme in Hebrews 3, 17, 3, 7 through 19. I mean, he says it many other ways, but you know, this congregation, the, the Hebrew, the Hebrew church, um, can really relate to this, right? Because they were experienced; they had been faithful, they had walked with the Lord, and they had, had bore fruits. But they were needing endurance; they were dwindling down, they were struggling, right? They were under the discipline of God, and uh, and they were tempted by by going back to the old ways, the things that Christ very Himself fulfilled. They were tempting to, to go back. And so he writes to them a brilliant letter connecting how the things that they were wanting to go back to were fulfilled in Christ, right? And how Christ is better than all of those things. But one thing he does is he exhorts them on this, on this, on this text. He says, don't be like that generation who failed to enter the promised land because of unbelief. Don't be like them. And then he gives them exhortations. He says in, in Hebrews 3, 7 through 19, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they, sh they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Right? And so he uses that story to exhort them to continue on. And I just... Based upon, all right, how do we now apply all of these things that we've learned? God's faithful, and we learn, man, Israel had all the promises, they had all the provisions, and we're not able to enter. And then the New Testament uses this as an exhortation to us. So I just want to, to close by just kind of going through some of the points that the author of Hebrews makes so that we could learn from their example and do the things that God tells us to do so that we could enter into the greater promised land. Um, so just to fly through, how, how can we finish the race in our wilderness wanderings? So we're all in the wilderness right now. We are 
walking through. We're not in the promised land yet. We have been purchased, and we have the deposit, right? But the co- complete fulfillment of it is not yet, right? Um, how do we remain faithful and finish the race in our wilderness wanderings? Here's what the author of Hebrews says. Number one, continue in good Christian fellowship. He's, that's the first thing he says to do. In um, chapter 3, verse, verse 12, right? Um, the first thing he says is, and the reason why I say good, because he says, don't neglect to meet to one another with one another, but exhort one another and um, stir one another up to good works and encourage one another. The reason why I say good, because he's not just saying, hey, have Christian friends where y'all talk about sports all day, but he's saying like, no, have people in your life who spur you on and who will exhort you and who will encourage you, right? And so that's a huge thing. Um, two, he says to keep the, believe the gospel and keep believing it. He says in four, chapter 4, verse 2, For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. So that just means keep hearing the gospel, keep believing the gospel, and continue to keep believing the gospel. Um, what are some other things he says? Um, he says, keep drawing near to your sympathetic, all-powerful high priest who will provide for you the strength to keep going. So, you know, he, he's saying that like, hey, you are, you're being like the, those in the wilderness. You're, you're weak. You're, you're, you're wandering around, right? You're, you need grace. He doesn't just rebuke them. You know, that verse led us then with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need, is written in the context of to a people who were getting ready to go back, who were growing weary in their journey, right? And, and, and God saying, come and meet with me, I'll give you grace. I'm a man too, I know what it's like to live this life, I know it's hard, but I'm also God, right? And I can give you everything you need. So another thing he says to do, continue to come to Jesus. Come to the throne of grace over and over so that you can continue on. Um, Number four, he says, be fully convinced of the fulfillment of all of God's promises. Um, Hebrews 6, 11 11 through 12 says, And we desire that each one of you show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who, through faith and patience, inherit the promises. So he'll, he'll say to have the full assurance of faith over and over. Have the full assurance of hope. What is he saying? Be fully convinced of, the, of all of God's promises being true. And be patient in it. It's not going to all... Then he gives a list of all these heroes of the faith and saying, yeah, you know, Abraham had to wait 25 years. He was patient, right? And so you, you're suffering right now. Right? Christ is coming back, but believe him to do so and, and live your life faithfully for the, the rest of your times on earth. Be convinced that this is the future and be patient until it comes. Um, five, he'll tell us, lay aside every weight and sin and keep your eyes on Jesus who began your faith and will bring it to completion. So he says, lay aside your weight the things in your life that, 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 that keep you down, and also the sins, and keep your eyes on Jesus, who not only started your faith, but has the ability to perfect it and to complete it. So we must always keep our eyes on Jesus, who, who will see it through. And we constantly need that reminder. Our faith continuing on isn't in our hands. It's in Christ's. Um, six, stay, faith, stay faithful in faith-driven obedience. He says, he says, make straight paths for your feet. Let, lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. Strive for peace with everyone and without holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Right. So remember what they did. They gave in to their desires and their idolatries and their adulteries. Right. He's saying, you know, keep the faith and keep obedience. Keep going. Um, and lastly, seven, um, he says, be a... He says, um, we, we, we can be accountable to godly local church leadership. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. So he's saying also, you want to continue on 
and make it to the promised land, not only do you need a good local church with community, but you need good local leaders who um, can keep watch over your soul. Anyway, just a few things from the New Testament about how we can apply it. Um, so let's pray, and let's pray that the Lord would um, just help us to do these things. Close this. Father, we just thank you for your word. Lord, I'm thank, thankful that um, for every breach of faith that I make in my life, I have someone greater than Moses praying for me. And um, Lord, I just want to pray that you would help us to keep our eyes on Christ, that we would be fully convinced of all of your promises. Lord, and that, um, Lord, I pray for us to make it to the end. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.